Yeah, there may be occasional other references to uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. So, uh, good morning. Uh, I gotta tell you, it's kind of vaguely surrealistic presenting in your socks. It's kind of like that dream you have where, you know, you don't go to class for like a whole semester and the finals, you know, tomorrow and you're like, ah, but it's pretty weird. Um, quick, quick poll, just so I can level set this thing a little bit is, uh, how many of you have had some experience with pandas in the past? Okay, good. Because um, what we're going to do is um, we're going to do a two-level thing. One is going to be a little bit of static content so we can level set. Here's what we're going to talk about. Then we're going to switch over and do it kind of live in an um, in IPython notebook. So we're actually going to be running against some things and we're going to do some simple examples to illustrate the concepts and then actually use a live data set to kind of go and drill down on some, some bigger ones. Kind of just real brief bio, been using a Python for a long time. Um, worked for Sun Microsystems for over 22 years and Oracle for four hours. Uh, and, it, and it was by mutual consent. Um, um, but, you know, at Sun, there was a lot of times when we were like, look, Java's the answer, what was the question? And, and a lot of those places, I used a lot of Python stuff on the back end. Um, yeah, data wrangling and things like that, but I've also used it for things like discrete event simulation, a lot of different things. It's a great, great toolkit and a, a great thing to have in the toolkit and I've had it, had it there for a long time. One of the things I want to kind of point out and Pradeep kind of hinted at it is um, there's a magic to Python in that if you kind of look back over its ancestry, and I've used it since 152, so whatever that is, the 95 time frame, it never was the incumbent language. It always was going to be in next to something, so it always accommodated things, and it always learned to leverage things. So when you look at you know, Python, which is this kind of pretty friendly kind of interpreter, it could actually drop down and do pretty sophisticated numerical computations because NumPy could actually bind itself to the dusty deck that you had for you know, numerical algorithms. And you could work with Python but you could still drop down and get pretty close to performance that's, you know, like being on the metal. So Python leverages, 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 and Panda is a great example of that, and we're going to kind of talk about that. So as I kind of mentioned earlier, we're going to do just a few slides to kind of set, here's the things we're going to talk about in a little bit of a pictorial fashion, and you'll look at those and say, don't quit the day job because you have no future as an artist. Um, uh, but it's mostly going to be live. So. The key takeaways, what I want you to get away from this is, uh, you know, what Pandas is good for and what it isn't. It's not a one size fits all, it doesn't fit everywhere. I mean, one thing right off the bat is Pandas is currently kind of an in-memory kind of analysis tool. I've used Pandas a lot for data analysis on some extremely large data sets that came off of Hadoop things. But you have to kind of apply statistical reasoning to, I can't take a full terabyte into my machine yet, but, uh, um, but Pandas has got some other great features in that you're kind of working in one language, um, which means it's going to reduce uh, friction in your tool chain, and I think that's really important. We're talking about two of the key data structures that are in Pandas. It's not all of them, and we won't be able to illustrate all the concepts. Um, the main thing I'm going to really hammer on is indexing data, because uh, Pandas has all kinds of statistical functions in it. Uh, it's got all kinds of plotting functions and they're easy to get to. The key thing is though, was when somebody goes, usually you know, an executive who's been on a plane and read a magazine, and it says, hey, this data set we've got, it's valuable, analyze it and tell us how to do the thing. You kind of have to go through an exploration of that and the key to making pandas or pretty much any tool chain really work to your benefit quickly to go really fast in iteration is being able to index and set up your data and I think pandas has got some great things there. So just quick quick overview of some of the key data structures. Um, there are two, one, two that we're going to talk predominantly about today. One is series. Now the panda series is a uh, it's an array and you're like okay that's not exciting. Uh, but it's an array that is like a dictionary in that you can index it by arbitrary Python objects. 
So I can have a, any kind of data stored in column kind of fashion and I can index it from the side with anything that's essentially a hashable object. Um, and, and we're going to see that uh, in detail. So if you think of expanding that, there's the notion of the pandas data frame, which is kind of like a whole bunch of columns that you can come across with any kind of index. Um, typically, what I've done a tremendous amount of time series analysis, pandas has got t killer time series support. So the index typically is a timestamp, and then you come across and you have all kinds of different columns. We're going to look at that in a pretty deeply, but so as you might imagine, uh, the big difference here between like a regular NumPy array and a data frame is the columns can be heterogeneous, meaning I don't need to actually have unified objects. In fact, the columns can be panda or can be Python objects, which means they can be kind of anything, and it's extremely powerful. So, um, and just kind of a preface, uh, and also potentially to our viewers at home, I'm on the back end of a pretty nasty cold, so if I'm kind of nasally or a cough or something like that, apologies, but and sorry to you people at home, we'll get blown away. But uh, so as you might imagine, data frames are easily addressed in a couple of different ways. And this is kind of the building blocks we're going to look at. You can do column addressing. Um, columns are basically an associative, find me this thing, you know, and give me all of the data on it. I can do multi-columns, so I can only pick certain ones out. I, I can also do row addressing. I can do multi-row addressing. And then I can combine them to actually do a selection out of it. Now, the key thing about this is, is Pandas is really well thought out. It's a rapid moving project. But one of the things that happens is when you do a selection from one data frame with whatever the criteria is, it hands you back another data frame. So you're able to keep kind of this homogenous chunking along as you go through you're getting back the same object. You're very rarely flipping out into something different or basically just like, here's a bunch of spooge, you deal with it. You're going to hand back something that's going to have methods on it, and that's very powerful. So indexing is the key. Um, selecting the data and how you do that um, is what we're going to actually go and look at a lot, and that's how you do computing and, um, and plotting on them. What this has enabled me to do is typically how I'll work is I'm kind of the computer guy, the analysis guy. I've done a lot of machine learning things and control theory kind of spaces. But I'm sometimes not the domain expert. Like, I'm not an online advertising person or a marketing person. But I like to kind of cozy up to those people because it's the domain that drives the business. So what I want to be able to do is translate what they're looking for very quickly into things in the data to say, is this what it looks like? You know, artist conception. With pandas, you're able to do and highly iterate what if scenarios really quickly, and we're going to kind of talk about that. So, okay, on to the exciting part. Now, this is going to be done in, uh, this is an IPython notebook. It's actually been recently renamed, if you've seen them before, to Jupyter. And what they're doing is saying, look, the notebook metaphor, which is I've got a thing that's a viewport onto a live Python session that, in my viewport has nice things. I can do markdown. I can have a cell kind of uh, metaphor, like if you use Mathematica or something like that. But the back end may be on my machine. It may be elsewhere. In fact, I, my machine, this is actually from uh, Clayton and Calvin Lohner, because my machine died last Thursday with the blue screen of death, which Macs actually can get. Um, <laughs> Uh, and it's a known problem, so if you have a uh, early 2011 MacBook Pro, see me after this. Um, uh, I actually have a DigitalOcean instance of this spun up and actually can run all of the stuff on it for a whopping, you know, 10 cents an hour, 7 cents an hour, whatever it is. So the notebook can be separate from where the computation is. But in this case, it's actually running local, and so I'm going to kind of show you the drill. And this is a pretty nice thing. I've actually, and I could do it now, but I don't want to tempt the, the demo gods. I've restarted the kernel. There's nothing running in it, so this is all going to run live. And if you know anything about it, right here, that shows you that this has not actually run anything yet. So I'm going to go ahead and do this. So this is a real common idiom you're going to see in basically NumPy. And, oh, yeah, and um, that's a great point. Uh, let me know if I'm making you seasick with making this thing go uh, scrolling up and down. So now I've actually been assigned a history to it. I've imported 
Um, NumPy is NP, that's a real common thing you see. You'll see pandas as PD. I brought in uh, some of the plotting stuff, it's just as PLT. This is a, uh, um, a recent version of pandas. Um, I actually pulled it out of Mac port, so if you're a Mac person, so it's, this is running Python, IPython uh, 3.4, so it's a Python 3.4, um, and that's the NumPy version. So um, this is, uh, the notebooks actually try to do a lot of really cool things with a large data set, and we're gonna be looking at a data set of about a quarter million rows by 100 and, um, 109 columns. It's kind of like, whoa, um, and we're gonna disable some of the things that are, it's trying to help us on, but this just kind of sets it up. So, here's our series object. So as we talked about, now just to kind of give you the drill when you look at these cells, what this means um, is None of this has been executed yet, and essentially this is almost like Lisp and that the, it's the last result that's going to print. So I'm going to make a thing, in this case a series, I use the, the uh, namespace uh, reference and I basically use the constructor. I'm just going to basically say I just want five things and here's the index for it. The key point here is I'm using an arbitrary index of strings. So now when I execute that, it's going to go ahead and give me a, um, let me just kind of reference this here so it looks the same. So now you see that, okay, I've got this thing. I've got a column of numbers, that's range, but I've got the, you know, what appears to be this column of indexes that are you know, single letters. Um, not to kind of you know, belabor the point, but they can be kind of any hashable object. So here I'm gonna just use some larger strings. Uh, and I have no idea why the fruit thing came up. I think that was the antihistamines, but... Um, um, so, and just to make it a little easier as we begin to combine these, you'll see uh, I made these numbers actually multiples. So, um, what's kind of cool is that pandas understands you're usually going to have multiple tables you're going to be bringing together. And I don't want to kind of wreck the, the thrill later on, but um, time series, you're always getting time series things that are you know, they're the same but different, you know, and people tell you that with a straight face and not laugh. And what you want to do is actually kind of be able to me meld them together. That's super easy with pandas. And like, here's just, this isn't a time series example, but to add that, it's basically like, oh, you want to concatenate these and to make a new series. So again, this is kind of running in Python. So now I have another object called S and it's got, this is its indexing thing and it's basically handled, handled you know, how to, uh, unify the indexing and what the columns are. If you have one that's bigger than another, it can handle that too. It, it kind of is a, it doesn't care. Um, just as we've talked about, you can index now. So here's this thing. So instead of like indexing a NumPy array with S0 or something like that, um, I've gone and I've used a hashable index thing and I've used, uh, in this case, got the first element you can use these things, you could use tuples. Um, you can use a lot of different things uh, in there. In fact, you can do some things that aren't wise, and we'll see that here shortly. Um, so you can do assignment. So you're basically doing, wow, let there be light. Uh, I did not do that. Uh, but maybe I should have taken credit. Uh, so we can still see, okay. Keep, keep rolling. But in the Python way, Pandas has gone and, and, and puts in a lot of syntactic sugar so that you can actually treat things in kind of the way that you'd expect to. So in terms of slicing through, through things, you can slice by range. So I can, I can basically just say, hey, here's these things I'm interested in, you know, and it'll go and it'll take the index and I'll go through them. Um, and it kind of does kind of the logical things. Short day here, 1150. Uh, but it also is kind of like, oh, you know, you just gave me this thing that essentially was a, you know, a short-circuited for loop or while loop, however you want to think about it, so it returns nothing. Um, the series object can actually be indexed numerically. This is probably not what you want to do a lot of times, but you can do it. So in this case, um, you know, we've basically gone into the fourth uh, 
um, the fourth element, which is um, the fifth, if you, you know, since Python's zero uh, indexed. So here we've assigned the, to that element. That's really not what you want to do for these things because you've got this associative indexing capability, so you want to use it. So just to kind of hammer that point home, um, here's kind of a mixed bag of, of indices. So we've got dogs, cats, wombats, but item number three, index position three, is really a floating point number, 4.0. It's a hashable thing, so you can actually use it to index. And then to kind of make matters worse, the fifth, or the, uh, yeah, the fifth object, which would be number four in the indices, has actually got three. So it's completely legit to do something like this, where someone who would look at that, and actually it's kind of cool because they're saying, that's not cool, dude, don't do that. So in the future, it's probably gonna stop. But I've taken this thing, which looks like I'm assigning, uh, you know, like thinking, for and I've assigned it this thing. So it's like usually you do not in pandas want to use numerical indices unless you've really got a good reason. And that reason better be like, and that's why I don't want to do it in NumPy, which is all numerically indexed. So just kind of fair warning. It'll let you do things that aren't necessarily good for you. Um, the time series support is really, really good. So you can do things like, oh, okay, here I'm going to create a uh, date range. So what this has given me is a, it's returned an array of timestamps that I can now manipulate. And, you know, and just to kind of show you um, some of the cool stuff that's in the uh, IPython notebook is whenever you're kind of confused, it's got tab completion and all kinds of stuff. But if you're like, oh man, you know, what are the parameters of this call? If you do this with a question mark, it brings up basically a little blurb of here's all the parameters, here's what all the defaults are, um, and you know you just hit escape or X and it goes away. So now I have this array of dates, which I can index it numerically, so pay no attention to that man behind the curtain who just said don't do this, but um, just to kind of show you, here's what it's given me when I look inside that array, a timestamp. Timestamps actually can do some pretty cool things. You can compute on them. Um, if you want to do sophisticated kind of things, you actually want to have another time, um, time stamp object if you wanted to add you know, milliseconds or something like that. But again, syntactic sugar here made it so, oh, I'm a timestamp. I'm indexed by days. You wanted to add one to me. I'm going to just add one to the date. So now what I'm going to do is take and create a series that's indexed by timestamp. So this looks like, you know, they look like strings, but they're really timestamps. But now, because what's happening is Pandas seeing it, it knows it's timestamped indexed. It's you give it an ISO 8945, whatever the standard is, timestamp. And it's like, all right, I'm going to parse this string into the timestamp, and I'll use it to look into the index indices that I have. So here's a case. I give it a string for today's date. Um, and it basically indexes to, in fact, today's date, which is kind of what we want. You can do assignment. Um, it, it works kind of as you expected, but what's also kind of really cool is that you can take something that's time series indexed and do slicing on it. So you can go off and pick ranges. So here's a case of I basically took that original date's timestamps, and I'm going to just pull out a sele selection of them, and I can use that to basically index through and do some selection. So, you know, interesting. But here's something that I've used a ton of, is uh, a lot of times you get the big giant, you, there, the big giant data set sitting somewhere in a Hadoop cluster, and you get some samples of it, and, you know, you're trying to figure out how to think about it. And a lot of the stuff which is temporal in nature, time passes, some event happens, and now I really care about all of these things for some period of time. What's nice about having, uh, you can do computational indexing, which means I can actually take and pick a timestamp someplace in the series and then compute what that endpoint was and create an index off of that and either do an extract out of the data or, or do you know, whatever it is I'm gonna do. So, um, so here I've basically taken TS, it's a timestamp. So I can actually then do a slice which is like, since this time, this series is timestamped indexed by days, I am going to 
take the timestamp and I'm going to look three days in the future and pull out everything that indexes to that. So I don't know about you guys, but I've written a lot of time, I mean, pretty mentioned a lot of time series kind of things, and time is the quintessential pain in the rear. Um, so it's really nice to have something that kind of does the right thing for free. Um, and as you would expect, you can actually do slicing and assignments. Um, now, this is super cool because, again, I, a lot of times, especially when you have multi-server instances, people are giving you logs of whatever nature, and you know, everybody swears they're running you know, NTP, and all the machines are locked together in time, so the data set is essentially synchronous, they match, but you know, a lot of times they don't, so you're always kind of fudging with them. What's really cool, though, is you can merge time series, and it'll do the right thing. So, what we're going to do here is create a time series that's a limited period, it's 10 periods, but it's basically going to step, step in 12 hour increments, so half days. So we do that, we get this time series, and then we're gonna build a, uh, build just some data in there, and we're going to make it um, a little easier to see. So, so what we have is this time series that starts on April 26th at midnight, clicks forward 12 hours at a time, this is the column data elements for it. So now, this is one data set I've got, and I've got this other one. Just like we saw before, it basically does the right thing. So what I'm going to do here is the concatenation does not guarantee what the indexing order will be. And you know, since it's time and I want it to look right, I basically have added a method, sort index, at the end of it. So when I do this, it's going to take that time series, it's going to meld the hand, it's going to match up the timestamps and put them in correctly, and um, it, it does all the interleaving and everything for free. Now, even though the time series of one is actually shorter than the other, one's 12 increment, ten, one's 10 days uh, incremented by days, the other one's 10, 12 hour intervals. So it sticks them in, thing, in, in correctly and sorts them in. Indexing would all work right. And that is super, super powerful if you ever have to do a lot of time series processing because it'll just get you to kicking the tires on the real problem rather than like, oh man, how do I parse this you know, weird time series that somebody gave me. So quick, um, quick check. How are we doing on people kind of tracking this okay? Okay, a few thumbs up, some puzzled looks, that's okay. The other one we talked about is data frames. So data frames are essentially, you know, kind of uber series. They're multiple columns, all indexed by whatever the index is on the side. There are mil not millions, that's hyperbole. Uh, there are a lot of constructors to make data frames from any conceivable Python object, so I'm going to do a very simple one here. I'm going to make one column that is basically, uh, and I'm going to make this indexed by time, because, you know, I like that. Uh, it's going to have two columns. One's going to basically be a range, you know, counting from zero to the length of the dates. The other one's going to be that, but actually added with 100. And I'm going to show you some data frame manipulation. Um, so, and here's actually where the IPython notebook's doing some nice HTML tables for us. So we've created this data frame. It's got two columns. It shows us what the data element is on it. So now, so it's got two columns. And so now we're going to go through that, some of that addressing I talked about earlier. So let's just say that column zero, and this can be named anything, but you see I'm extremely creative, so I called it column zero. Um, but so I'm going to index the data frame basically using array syntax with whatever uh, the column is, and it goes and it's like, okay, here's the thing. I'll give that to you. Um, and that works for uh, column. So what's it actually doing in these cases, in fact, I will now attempt to do a, uh, a new little bit here in that um, I'm going to add a cell and I wanted to say, hey, what is the type, oops, um, what is the type, and this is an IPython shorthand of last output. Um, what it's done when it's basically taken the data from apart is it's handed me series. What that means is all of the series methods come when I do all these extractions. Also, when I do a more, more complex selection and it hands me back a data frame, all the data methods come for free, or data frame methods come for free. That's super powerful because it means I'm learning 
one or two instances methods and I'm able to apply them to everything, which means I pick up all the stats functionality, all the plotting functionality, and it's all kind of homogenous, which I think is, is super powerful. Um, I can do the row indexing, which you know kind of works the way you want. I think we've already seen that you can do this. Uh, oh yeah, this is. If I want to do more complex kind of queries, you you can only do so much gaming the system in terms of syntactic sugar. So there's these other things called indexing uh, indexers. Um, loc is one of those. So if I were to do this, and you know this is kind of what truth in advertising, you know. You know, I always see this a lot. Here's, you know, IPython, IPython saying something terrible has happened. Um, it's basically a key error, key error, and what it really wants you to do is basically use an indexer that can come on the side because this is a data frame, uh, and um, it will go and now return to me what the elements are in this column across, which is kind of what you'd expect. I can also do the two-dimensional kind of addressing, pull out that you know, the, the column zero element. Uh, I can do the same thing, slice on time. Uh, cool thing about data frames is that uh, you can dynamically add things. Here I'm going to add a column called rand. That's basically just these uh, random numbers which we're gonna manipulate a little bit with. So I've added to the original data frame, which may have come from right off a file or something like that. I've added a column. I can now actually operate on whole columns. So in this case, I am going to subtract the column zero, which is a, just this incremented thing, and then something adding 100 to it, so I get 100 back. So you can actually index and do computations off of that. Um, this kind of tells you you're getting a series back. Um, I can actually do apply methods, like there's all kinds of statistical things which we've kind of alluded to. I can also reference um, if the column name doesn't have spaces, I can actually reference it as an attribute. So here the data frame has, I'm using kind of a mixed, mixed match thing here. I'm using a string index for one. Using the attribute reference for the other, I can do math on them, kind of no surprise. Um, you can do kind of arbitrarily complex things. This is just a made up example. And um, just a real handy tool is head and tail to kind of, when you get data structures back, it's kind of nice to do a little, is this what I think it was? Um, now, super powerful thing that Pandas does is called uh, Boolean addressing. What Boolean addressing does is you take basically a data set and you apply some criteria to it saying, does this row or column match what I care about? And if it does, true. It, and then I can save that later. So just a Boolean thing as big as my data set is then I can apply that and use that to index and to extract things of value out. So here, this is the kind of the complete view of our current uh, our data frame. I'm interested in saying which, where are numbers less than zero? Now, what it returns is basically a, uh, you know, true and false. The thing is, is that even though Pandas was willing to do that for me, it was kind of not what I intended because if this had been a more um, heterogeneous data frame with like strings here, dates there, the relational operators don't make sense. So it would have made more sense to actually be a little bit more directed. So what I'm gonna do here is say, okay, you know, who is, who's below zero? And um, more particularly, I can actually do that, this is an idiom you'll see a lot, I can do the Boolean calculation inside an indexing frame and just do it all in one shot. So here, I've basically said, okay, here's my data frame. Where are the data frame, uh, this column, which is RAND, which are below zero, return that as a Boolean and index that and give me the data frame back. So now it's gone to this array and pulled out the stuff that is, uh, is in fact below zero. And, and just for hammering the point home, if you go and match these up, you'll see, in fact, I am not lying to you yet. Um, that uh, those are below zero. So now you can do compound ones. And again, these can be saved, but just to kind of, to illustrate what it's gonna look like, here I wanna find column zeros that are above five and rands that are below zero. Well, these are kind of just logical constructs and you put them together. This I do a lot and uh, I guess, make sure you yell at me if I'm kind of gesticulating with the mouse and you guys can't see it because it's too low. 
I've saved this Boolean index thing. So I've saved the results of a full table tra traverse into this variable, a Python variable, that I can save for later on. So I have a big data set, all kinds of funky criteria, crunch through, save those. So I still got the data set. Now I just have this indexing thing that allows me to repeat that calculation to sweet because I'm basically just doing a Boolean index across the whole thing. So it goes super fast. So now, so I'll actually execute this and I don't want to miss any because then it blows up and you'll go, he's definitely lying. Um, so series is kind of what it's returning to index. So now I'll take the Boolean index and it goes and here's the ones where column zero is above five, here's below zero. And the thing is, is that the data frame is unchanged and we could have saved the results of that extract to another data frame. So Boolean addressing, really, really important. The key thing to remember about it, or one of the key things, is that when you do Boolean addressing like that, many times, if not at least all in my experience, what gets returned to you is a smaller size. So you have to kind of keep that in mind that the result of the index, you can't really use to index the original frame again because it's smaller, but it'll tell you because pandas will do it, but it will complain. Um, info is kind of a super handy thing to give you some summary information. Um, but in fact, if we look here that the original data frame was uh, 10 columns and it shows you the type. Here's the return data frame, which is two columns. Um, Okay, this, this data frame really is annoying me, so what do you, or this column. So you can just delete them, gone. So it's able, what I've done a lot of times is you're able to build com composite augmentation to your data set in place. So as you're doing things, as you're working with somebody who's like, hey, what about this? And you don't want to have a bunch of stuff to recalculate it all. You just, wham, you make a new column and put it on there. And, um, you can write out the augmented one, no problem. But now we're going to do you know, something a little bit more challenging. And uh, I know I'm going to hyperspeed mode, but I'm keeping an eye on the hook over there with the time cards. Uh, this is a real data set. This is basically a DOT data set from, uh, that basically shows um, all airline travel, I think, of the continental United States in great detail. And you can go get it, and when we post the slides, you can go play with this. But, so this is about a, uh, uh, 250 megabytes, so you know, pretty small. But um, it is one of those things when you look at it, and here's another little bit of magic that you get in IPython, is I'm actually jumping out to the shell, running the head command. Give me the top two lines of this, this data file. This is the on-time arrival, which is, when you look at it, kind of a, someone has a sense of humor at DOT. Um, but, uh, this is the one for July of 2013. And here's the 109 columns. Here's the first line of what that data looks like. Um, we're not going to deal with all 109 because, you know, it makes everybody's eyes bleed. I get that. Um, the key thing I wanted to point out here is that if you look here, there are a lot of things in here um, that are null values. And that can cause a lot of wailing and gnashing of teeth when you're doing this yourself. I'm going to show you. It's actually not too bad with pandas. Um, I'm not sure. This is actually a little thing I use to kind of go along. I'm not sure I use dump anymore. So out of 109, I'm actually uh, going to just deal with these columns, which is basically uh, some obvious date things, flight number, carrier, tail number, some things about delays and stuff like that. Uh, so now what I'm doing is the data set, which I just showed you the head of, is labeled. You know, it's a labeled CSV data set that you get off of any kind of ETL extraction kind of tool. I'm going to say, you know what, I don't care about all those. I'm, I just care about whatever this is, this 40 columns or something like that. So I've created a Python array of strings of the columns I want. Now I'm going to come to this line, which is kind of where the magic happens. I'm going to use the panda read CSV file. I'm going to give it the file. I'm going to tell it, there's a lot of columns in there, only read these. And I'm going to give it the columns, and it's going to basically match that all up. Um, I'm also going to say, I want you to index this by flight date. So it's going to look into the, te into the text representation for the time, and do the conversion on all that, bring it out as the index for that row entry, which allows me to do it. So it's a straight CSV file like you'd get out of any kind of you know, Excel kind of export or something like that. So here it takes, you know, it's kind of crunching. It's doing all the stuff. 
in there. It's basically saying, you know, you can actually specify a lot of things, and I, I don't want to show you, but you look at read CSV in your eyes, you know, you look at the help page and your eyes begin to bleed at first time, first time you do it. But after you get a little familiarity with pandas, you kind of see that as it's saying, what can I do to help you? And it, and it is really a very powerful and well thought out kind of thing. Um, this data set is not sorted, and I like things to be sorted by date, so I basically say sort the index. Okay, so we've got that. So now what do we have? Doing a quick info thing here. Um, we have uh, half a million and change of 45 columns of entries, and it tells you the types, and as you can see that, you know, some things are full, some things are not. Like, out of that, out of the month of July, there was about 9,600 canceled flights because there's a canceled code. So you begin to see immediately, like, oh, yeah, you know, not everything has to be there for the frame to be valid. And, you know, I just did that amount of work that you guys saw. You know, it's not like writing all of these conditional codes to, like, you know, oh, I got a, I got a cancel code, but I don't have an arrival airport or whatever. You know, it's, it works pretty reasonably. Um, I can index it by zero and see, okay, in fact, on the first, here's a flight, St. Louis to Omaha. Um, and, and kind of the data, the NANs are not a number, which are basically how the read CSV says, I could not, I did not want to fill that in. You can override it, but it's invaluable to actually have your data set have NANs in it, is that because what they're saying is, there was no value here. So you can begin to use that as a criteria to go through and look for valid rows. Um, because this works the way you want, you can actually do indexing. But here's where notebook actually kind of gets in your way a little bit. It's like, uh, it's really big. I'm going to render this giant HTML table. Um, I don't find that super helpful in this case. So I just basically say, just show me the text of it. So here's kind of what it looks like. Here's a United flight. It was going, you know, from Houston to New Orleans. You know, here's all kinds of stuff, departure, delay, time, things like that. Um, uh, we have to basically use kind of a label location method, which I, I'm going to just start using. Because if you, if you go in, you can actually, um, you can index it, which kind of works right. But when you begin to basically get things beyond that, you know, whoa, wailing and gnashing of teeth. But what you can do is say, by using this, the IX indexer, you say, I want to index you by both rows and columns. So here I'm going to go and do a quick slice through and say, hey, on the first 10, show me the origin, destination, and what the arrival delay was, which is the number of minutes that the flight was late compared to what the, the one it was supposed to be in. Um, since it's in Python, and these are objects. You can do reflection on the objects. You can query the objects. So it's like, what are the columns in this data frame? And then you can, since we're in a language that understands things like list comprehension, you can say, wow, it seems like there's a lot of delay things in there. I don't want to retype those. So I can do a list comprehension, pull out columns that have delay in them. And now I have a new column list called delays. So I can do things like, and I'm going to do a little bit of magic here, add the. Uh, add the carry and the flight number to it. Um, and so now I'll use that to index in here and it'll basically show me, here's what the delays were, here's what the departure delay was, minutes, here's what the codes were, because you know it's a weather delay, carry delay. NAS is the National Air Traffic System or something. Um, let's say you want to drill down on a particular carrier. Here I'm going to create a delta, they're by far the predominant carrier in this data set, an indexing uh, setup of uh, basically just where does the criteria meet uh, match of the carrier being equal to delta. So now I've got the shape of this original um, data set is that 571,000. The delta shape is basically a series of that same length. So now I can, um, and if you look at them, um, I can. The uh, delta, if you index by 100, it was a delta flight. I have just indexed the original data set, which is the July 2013 one. In fact, I go and look at this, and the carrier is, in fact, delta. If I go look at one that was carefully screened by your presenter, this is false, meaning the Boolean one. In fact, if we go and look, and this is, uh, I forget who the OO carrier is, but um, uh, you can now do things like here's another bit of magic, which is basically I want matplot. 
uh, lab things to occur in place. So this is not a super useful thing, but uh, you can basically say quickly do plots as part of the pandas package in line. Um, this you can, and there's all the matplotlib mat parameters, so you can extend the histograms, you can change the bins, kind of all for free. Uh, here again, I'm indexing my original data set by just the delta Boolean array. And um, I actually don't know why I was going to do that. Oh, I can do things like, uh, you know, what's the longest delay, which was a doozy of 1,100 minutes and change. I save that. I can go use IDX max as what's the index of that. And I can go show me, uh, show what the uh, fl uh, flight is. Um, and I can actually use max, which will go and basically index ouch, tell me who it was. And it is actually kind of interesting because it's a flight that originates and ends in Yuma, <laughs> which, you know, sounds like it should be a Western of some type. But um, you can actually now continue to do extraction. And I'm going to run out of time here, but I can actually go and pull out just the delta flight. So just DL is just delta. I can now go look at this and It'll show me, you know, these are, in fact, this data set, just DL, is just the delta flights extracted from the original data frame. I can continue that on to like, hey, let's see if we can do stuff just from Indy. You know, saving these as I go along, and then you can basically look at that data set, like what does the distribution look like for mm -hmm. uh, the arrival delays in, uh, coming in and out of Indy. And you can do other things like bar charts, which, this kind of illustrates a forest and trees problem, but you really want to aggregate this data by time, by day, because what you're looking at is the distribution for every flight, which is not what you want. So pandas actually has this notion of group by. I'm going to group by these things and basically get the mean for the daily arrival delay, and then I hand this off to uh, Matt Platt. Live, and it basically will show me what the mean delay looks like, which says that you want to really fly on the 4th of July because they have a very low delay, right? But, and this thing would work on the whole data set, and it goes pretty quickly. So I can do the exact same thing across the whole data set, all still there. So I've, that's kind of a just brief taste, <laughs> and I'm getting the, the official hook. But talk to me more. If you've got data sets that you think might work, talk to me kind of during lunch or break, and we can kind of go further. Because there's a whole other notion of actually indexing into the data and creating that the indices actually be bigger. The next example actually takes time in carrier and basically uses that index method. What that allows me to do is then index the table by either time or carrier or both. And it returns a data frame, which would be very specialized to, on this date, that carrier, this thing. And all works, all the stuff we've seen you. So sorry for not having a lot of time for questions, but come and talk to me. But thank you.